All right, so it's November, and Alan, I trust that you have major Thanksgiving plans ahead. Mm, nah, not really. Yeah, I don't really celebrate the holidays. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas. I mean, what's the deal with the uh, Christmas tree anyway? Well, speaking of the Christmas tree, and speaking of Thanksgiving, luckily I mentioned that, because none of this is scripted. Um, we're actually going to be discussing someone who actually had a major impact on the fact that we use the Christmas tree during Christmas and that we have a national holiday entitled Thanksgiving. You know, the Virgin Mary? Yeah. The Virgin Mary. You sicken me. Hmm. These might be good holidays after all. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Sons of History podcast. I am Dustin Bass. And I am Alan Joaquin. And we are excited about this episode. Actually, um, I've been looking forward to this episode for quite some time. I think we booked her, I want to say, a couple of months ago. And I was like, man, I can't wait to have Melanie Kirkpatrick on the show. Um, But before we get her on the show, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also subscribe wherever you're listening on the podcast, whether it's Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever. Um, Yeah, I mean, have you you actually subscribed to our YouTube channel yet? Or are you still out? No, I subscribed a long time ago. Really? Yeah. Did you do that like an hour ago? Okay, really? You think? Come on. Come on, I'm sitting here telling people to subscribe, to like us on Facebook, to follow us on Instagram. Subscribe, subscribe, <laughs> you know, subscribe, and then all of a sudden you're thinking, man, I got to make sure that I yeah, subscribe. I'm glad you said something because... <laughs> sure, double check? Yeah. Okay. Make sure that you're even on there. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a very special guest. Uh, Melanie Kirkpatrick is going to be joining us, and we're going to be talking about her new book. Uh, but before we do... Alan's going to be sure to, that he is subscribed to the, our, our YouTube channel, and we're going to do our This Week in History. All right, This Week in History, we're going to go not too far back, November the 11th, 1918. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month was the signing of the armistice. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, that was the end of World War One." No. It was the end of hostilities. It was not the end of World War I. The end mm-hmm. of World War I was not until the Treaty of Versailles was signed on June 28th of 1919. But the seizing of hostilities was the armistice, and the guns went silent. Uh, Hold know. on. Did you say seizing of hostilities? C- ceasing. Ceasing. Okay. C- 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 ceasing. Because if you they seized, seized the they, hostilities... They, the ending of hostilities. How's that? All right. Yeah. You, you know, all right, I'm going to interrupt you on yours. <laughs> yeah, you okay. typically do. Well, you know, all right. So now, uh, ironic enough, the um, the signing of the armistice was in a railway car in Com- Compagne, Compagne, France. Champagne? Compagne, Compagne. It's some like northeast of Paris. Um, the, the Here's the ironic thing was, was that when Germany invaded mm-hmm. in 1940 and uh, France surrendered, Hitler made sure that the that the French surrender was in that same yeah. railway car. It's pretty yeah. sick. Talk about, you know, vendettas. Yeah. You know how I am against vendettas and, and uh, yeah. you know, although I did. We learned that last week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I can kind of see why he did that. But anyway, but that's what happened. And, uh, you know, there, it you know, the Germans had to withdraw from all occupied territories, uh, there was still fighting going on in German East Africa, uh, but that was um, that. That's another story. Uh, News traveled itself. slow back in those days. Yes, yes, it did. Um, there was a German uh, general that was uh, doing guerrilla warfare, but other than that, yeah, the, the end of hostilities. Now the and now the Germans had to give up their navy. Uh, they went to Scapa Flow, but most of the uh, most of the German ships ended up being scuttled out of a sign of protest. And uh, and the British and the French and the Americans still continued the blockade uh, of Germany. So um, you know it was to force the Germans 
to submit to what the Treaty of Versailles was going to be. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the armistice was not the end of the war. It was just end of hostilities. They could have started up again yep. if the Germans didn't succumb. So um, now today it's celebrated as Armistice Day in most of the world. In the United States, it's celebrated as Veterans Day. So this now Veterans Day is for all veterans. It's not for the dead. The right. Memorial Day is for soldiers who died. Mm -hmm. Veterans Day is for all veterans. So that's going to be uh, this Thursday, November the 11th. Yeah, good stuff. All right, well, my uh, This Week in History is November 10th, 1871. Um, and speaking of Britain and all that jazz, man, it really ties in just real, real nice. Anyways, it doesn't tie in that great. So the explorer and journalist, uh, who was working for an, an American newspaper at the time, his name was Henry M. Stanley, um, formerly known as John Rawlings. Uh, he found the Scottish missionary, also an explorer, David Livingstone in Ujiji, Africa, or I don't know how to say it, but Ujiji, U-J-I-J-I. -J -I. That's what I'm going to name my son. You know, let's, can I do a tie-in real quick? Yeah, go for you it. You remember how I said that that German general, his name was Leto Vorbeck, Paul, Paul von Leto Vorbeck. Uh, he was fighting in German East Africa. That was the, like, um, you know, if you ever see the movie, The... Uh, the uh, African queen, mm -hmm. but that, it, that ended up, I don't know if it was at that time. It might've been maybe 10 years later, but that that town, it was in German East Africa. Very interesting. Thanks for cutting in. Yes. So Livingstone had actually been missing for two years. Uh, people were thinking, okay, he's probably dead. Um, well, S Henry Stanley was like, well, let me go see if I can't find him. And he went into sort of the, the deep of, of Africa, lost a ton of men, um, found Dr. Livingstone, and the famous words when he ran into him was, Dr. Livingstone, I presume? Now, I don't know if he did it in like a, a British accent or an American accent because he had well, been in America a, for yeah. a, quite some time. Was you he know, an American? No, he was, he was born in Wells, um, but he moved to um, New Orleans, actually, as a, as a young kid. So anyways, now, uh, pretty interesting is this book, How the Scots Invented the Modern World. Uh, Arthur Herman uh, does a pretty neat job of, of talking about that story, which he more or less has to take the highlights because he's covering all of the things that the Scots did. Obviously, the focus is on David Livingstone. Um, and speaking of Arthur Herman, one of my favorite authors, we're actually going to have him on the show in two weeks. And to start to talk about his new book. And speaking of movies, uh, you said The African Queen. Have you ever seen the movie Africa Screams with Abbott and Costello? No, but I did ride The African Queen, the actual boat. But uh, okay, yeah, no, no, there's an actual the actual okay. boat. Okay, I the wasn't movie. sure where you were going with yeah, that. It's in Key, <laughs> it's in Key Largo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that actual African Queen boat is in Key Largo. I love it. I love it. Well, in did, the did, movie, uh, Costello, in the movie, ride? Africa screams. Uh, Africa screams. Uh, uh, Costello. His name is Stanley Livingston. Okay, it's the combination of the two last names, uh, and okay. he said, "I am the world's greatest explorer." And of course, if you know Luke Costello, he is not. But it's a it's a funny movie. It's one of the ones I grew up on. All right, well, that is it for uh, this week in history. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Without further ado, we have Melanie Kirkpatrick as the guest on this episode. This is going to be. I am looking forward to this conversation, as I had mentioned earlier. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, who is Melanie Kirkpatrick? Uh, she is an author and journalist. Uh, she worked for the Wall Street Journal for about 30 years, and she was also the deputy editor uh, for the editorial page. Uh, she is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and she has written three books. Uh, she has written Escape from North Korea, The Untold Story of Asia's Underground Railroad, Thanksgiving, The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience, and her latest book that we'll be talking about, Lady Editor, Sarah Josepha Hell and the Making of the Modern American Woman. Prepare yourself, brace yourself, uh, because we've got Melanie on the line. Melanie, how are you doing? 
I am doing wonderfully well and looking forward to celebrating our 400th uh, Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. I, I am too, because not every day of the year, but at least once a day, maybe twice a day out of the year, I like to practice the art of gluttony. So <laughs> you don't? Oh, yeah, no, you don't. I, yeah. I, no, you don't. No, you know, I used to be that way, but no, I do. Uh, you know, I, I put the stuff on my plate and walk away and I'll grab the dessert and I'll walk away. And it's like, this is it. This is my limit. So you grab the food and then you walk away. You don't even eat it? No, I, I just don't. I know I'm not going to go back for seconds. Okay. Like, well, I, I will take the dessert this way. I don't have to go back and get tempted. Obviously, so. the food's not very good at uh, Alan's Thanksgiving, so. <laughs> I am yeah. not celebrating it this year, so there you go. So you, you, uh, you're you out in, in the New England area. You're out in Connecticut. What are the Thanksgivings like out there? Uh, I wonder. You know, I think, I think they're like everywhere in America and uh, everywhere uh, where Americans celebrate abroad, too. One survey says that 88% of Americans eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Not a big surprise, but uh, nonetheless interesting. And uh, um, one writer, uh, uh, who's a uh, cookbook writer whose work I read, said you could tell where a person was from uh, if you know what kind of pie he or she eats on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, she wrote that in the 50s, so I don't know if it's true today. But apple pie is very popular in New England. Um, and of course, pumpkin pie is popular everywhere, I think. And uh, you still see mince pie once in a while. I don't know if that's, that tradition has reached uh, Texas. But uh, sweet potato pie is another one. And um, You know, that was, some, that was my favorite pie when I was a kid. Mince? Yeah. I've never had mince pie. Now, you did in, in the book mention pecan pie as a southern dish. And I was like, yes, yes, 100% that is a southern dish. So we love our pecan pie here in Texas. Mm -hmm. So, and my mother, shout out to my mom, she makes the best pecan pie out there that I've, I've ever tasted. So she does very well. Yeah, you're a lucky man. Indeed, I am. Now, speaking of Thanksgiving, we have uh, a copy of your book, Thanksgiving, and we also have, obviously, Lady Editor, which is what we're wanting to talk about uh, during this conversation. And we'll probably touch on the Thanksgiving book uh, throughout the conversation. But first question, let's talk about um, your book, Lady Editor, Sarah Josepha Hill. Um, before getting into, I guess, the, the depth of what what she became later in life. Can you give a brief description of her pre-career life and the tragedy and hardship that she faced? Sarah Josepha Hale was born on a farm outside a little village in, um, in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, she was born in 1788, uh, the year before Washington took uh, office as president of the United States. And she lived, uh, I should say, as an aside, through 19 presidents. Rutherford B. Hayes was president when she died in uh, 1879 at the age of 90. And, uh, you know, as a farm girl, she uh, learned all about how to, you know, run a farm and all the traditional work that women would do on a for farm. But she also had a family that prized education. And her mother, uh, uh, felt that girls should be as well educated as boys and homeschooled her family to, uh, with that in mind, the girls learned the same thing as the boys. And when her brother Horatio, who was uh, a near contemporary and they were very close, when her brother Horatio went off to Dartmouth, Sarah couldn't go with him, but Horatio would come home in the holidays and teach her everything he had learned at Dartmouth. So uh, she had the rough equivalent of, a, of an Ivy League education, 175 years before the first girl was admitted to Dartmouth. When she, uh, she then went on to be, uh, she set up her own little school uh, where she taught very small children, preschool, kindergarten age, young, their ABCs and, and their numbers. And there's a tradition not, uh, that school still exists. It's a one room schoolhouse. And there, there's a tradition, not uh, confirmed, that that's where she got the inspiration for her most famous poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, 
who followed a little girl to school one day. Um, she married at uh, uh, the day before her 25th birthday to a lawyer who, um, like her, was very intellectual. And the two of them would spend every evening um, after dinner from uh, eight to 10 in study. They would study French, they would study English literature, they would study the sciences, botany, physics, et cetera. Uh, and then he died suddenly uh, of pneumonia, leaving her with four children and a fifth on the way. She was, oh gosh, in her early 20s, in early 30s, pardon me. And, um, you know, in the, this was the 1820s, the early 1820s. And back then, the only respectable profession open to a, a woman who had to support herself was needlework. And the local Freemasons set her up in a millinery shop, uh, but she hated it. Her husband had been a Mason, so they were trying to help her out. And, um, but her husband had always liked her poetry. So, Sarah decided that she would try to write. She knew of no woman who had ever made a living as a writer, but she was determined to try. The Masons uh, published her first book, which was a collection of poetry. And then a couple of years later, she published her first novel, which was an anti-slavery novel. That was successful. And it called her to the attention of a man in Boston who was establishing a magazine for women. And he wrote to her out of the blue and asked her if she would be the founding editor. This was a difficult decision for her because um, her, her biggest ambition in life was to educate her children. She talked about that a lot in print and in uh, her correspondence, that this was her goal. She wanted her children, she had five kids, to all be well-educated. And she didn't have the money to make that happen. So she thought that if she took the job in Boston, she would be able to help them get a good education. Um, however, a lot of people back home in Newport thought she was crazy to do this, number one, breaking up her family because she couldn't take all of her children with her. She took only took the baby. And number two, they just said, you know, you're going to fail. No woman has ever been successful at this sort of thing. But off she went. It was 1828. She, um, you know, in January 1828, the magazine opened. Um, it was called The Ladies Magazine, and it, it later merged with um, uh, the ladies' book, which became Godey's ladies' book. So that's the potted history of how she got into journalism. Well, and look now, when as you were saying, she does become the editor of uh, of Godey's ladies' book. Now, how did that have an influence on American society? Oh, that is such a big question, Ellen. Let me try to I kind of uh, hit the highlights here. Uh, Godey's ladies' book. Uh, under her editorship became the, the best selling magazine in uh, the country prior to the Civil War. Uh, when she took over um, the combined magazine in uh, 1837, the circulation was about 10,000. By 1860, it was um, 100,000, 150,000, pardon me. And the average circulation of the magazine in 1860 was 7,000. Now, Godey's Ladies Book had um, a much larger circulation than the numbers would indicate because uh, readers typically passed along their copies of the magazine to family and friends. So the, the, the reach of the magazine was much bigger. I should also mention that it was one of the first successful national magazines. And Godey's Magazine, uh, there were subscribers in every corner of the nation. And uh, so her, her influence um, extended well beyond uh, one geographic area or one um, uh, category of, of woman. Um, and what was the impact? There were 
there were so many, it's hard to begin, but very briefly, let me mention three, and then we can talk more about them if, if you'd like to. Um, the impact starting in 1828, when she launched uh, her magazine, the impact on um, the national uh, understanding and acceptance of women's roles was enormous. She believed that women um, and men were uh, intellectually equal, but men had a big advantage because they had been educated. So um, she wanted women to have the same educational opportunities as men had. So in her magazines, she would champion this idea again and again. She would follow the progress of um, seminaries and then colleges for girls as they were uh, established, uh, telling her readers about them. She also championed women being teachers. Now today, um, I just checked the other day um, of, of uh, public school key teachers from K through 12, 76% are women. That's no surprise. That's been the case for many years. But back in the 1820s, um, women were considered unfit to be teachers, except of small children. And one of her big campaigns was um, to uh, uh, encourage um, schools, public schools, uh, to accept women as teachers and also to found schools of education so that women could be educated to, uh, to do a good job of teaching. So education of women, that was one role. And then it, as the years went by, she also became very um, uh, impactful in writing about uh, professional fields that uh, she thought women should enter, such as doctors. She was a big proponent of women being doctors. That's number one. Number two was um, the, uh, the um, American literature. Hale had this idea that while um, the country had been unified politically by the Revolutionary War, it was not unified culturally. And she wanted to use her magazine to help create a, a common literary culture for Americans. And then as um, the years went on, also a common a kind of um, ordinary culture such as cooking and fashion and um, stuff like that. But she had a real sense of talent and she would publish, uh, she wanted to publish American writers writing on American topics. Now this would seem obvious to us, right? Of course, Americans wanna read about American topics, but uh, that wasn't the case back then. In the 18, early part of the 19th century, most magazines were um, made up of articles that had been uh, stolen from English and other publications. And uh, they called those editors cut and paste editors because they would you know, literally take a pair of scissors, cut out an article and then paste it into their magazine uh, before it was printed. But Hale uh, wanted original content and she began to publish um, writers that we all have heard of today like Nathaniel Hawthorne and Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and uh, she also championed uh, American um, women who wrote and she uh, wrote the, um, uh, published the early works of Harriet Beecher Stowe um, among others. So, uh, she, and her, the, the stories and poetry that all these contributors wrote and that she published were uh, you know, about American themes, about nature, about travel, about emotion. Uh, they, you could read one of the short stories today and get a, a, a pretty good sense of what life was like in a middle-class household back then. Um, what they ate, how, how a woman talked to her husband, uh, what was the children's role. So there, um, some of them are great literature, most of them aren't, but they're all interesting. And um, I, I found that aspect of her work fascinating. And then uh, number three, uh, an offshoot of her interested, interest in Americana, that is bringing the nation together culturally, is the holiday of Thanksgiving. Now, just about every state had a Thanksgiving holiday and sometimes, it, but it, and it was called by governors. 
uh, some states would or or, or um, territories would celebrate every year. They didn't have an annual date sent for it, but the govern and the governors didn't coordinate. So uh, there were people celebrating all over the place, uh, any time from September till um, even December. Um, and there was a funny saying that I, I came across that uh, about how if you planned your itinerary carefully, you could have a good Thanksgiving dinner every week between election day and Christmas day. Uh, but Hale had a, a, a grander vision. She thought that uh, if Americans gave thanks for their blessings all in the same day, all around the country and everywhere where Americans gathered abroad, then that would help to unify the country. And her, uh, her campaign took extra vigor, extra, extra force as the country moved towards civil war. And it was her great hope that um, celebrating uh, a national Thanksgiving uh, would help avert war. Uh, she uh, um, not only carried out her campaign in the pages of Ladies Godie's book, Godie's Ladies book, she also wrote to what we would call today influence makers. She wrote to governors and members of Congress and to presidents of the United States. And because she was a celebrity, she was a very respected figure, um, they, um, many of these people wrote back to her. And that was one of the more interesting aspects of, of my research to uh, follow her correspondence with um, famous people. Uh, and in 1863, Lincoln agreed and called the first in our modern day series of National Thanksgiving Days. This year will be the 158th National Thanksgiving Day. What Wasn't there like a sort of slight correspondence between her and Queen Victoria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, a wonderful tale. I'm, I'm glad you um, uh, noticed it, Dustin. Um, she, she was a great writer, too. Um, I didn't mention that, but uh, the Yale Bibliography of American Literature says that she wrote, edited, or contributed to 129 books over the course of her life. A pretty amazing statistic. Um, but the work she regarded as her uh, best, it was um, a nonfiction work called Woman's Record. And it's the first, um, it's the first example of, um, of women's history. She went back um, 2,500 years and compiled biographies, uh, short biographies, of famous women, women who had made a contribution to, to their world. That included biblical figures, uh, 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 women from the classical world, and then up to the, the modern day. And when the, it took her three years to do it. And when the book was published, she uh, sent it off to people uh, trying to, you know, to, to share it with them. And she really wanted to get it to Queen Victoria whom she admired, um, she thought was of a very high moral standing and that she would be a good example for American women. Um, and so she asked James Buchanan, the future um, American president, if he would take it to her um, when he was named ambassador uh, to uh, the United Kingdom. And he did. That's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to have a uh, lady editor uh, delivered uh, by the American ambassador today to Queen Elizabeth, but I, I don't have um, I don't have Hale Sutzbach. Anyway, uh, it was he delivered it to uh, Queen Victoria, who wrote back through um, her secretary, of course, and uh, was um, admiring of the work. Well, you know, you. I was going to say she had an influence on Christmas trees, uh, yes. wedding gowns, and, and you know you mentioned a, uh, a few careers for women, but just generally women in the workforce. Yeah, the women. There were certain jobs that she didn't think women uh, should do. Uh, politics was one of them. Um, it was a dirty business, and she thought women women were of a higher moral order. Um, but she was very keen on, you know, everything from women being waitresses to women being 
medical doctors and her uh, nurses, um, government clerks, um, post mistresses. Uh, she campaigned um, for all of those, for women entering all of those professions. Um, and, but her, I, I thought her, her concept of a female physician was particularly interested. She advocated that um, women be admitted to medical school, go to medical school, become licensed doctors. But um, she wanted women to, te to, to take care of only women and children. And she thought men shouldn't. Uh, men should just take care of uh, grown-up grown up men. So she wanted to limit the, um, the practice of female doctors to women and children. Um, and that's kind of interesting because she thought that they would have a, a special compassion for uh, their, their patients in a way that um, uh, was not so for, for men. Um, so the women in the workplace, for sure. Uh, but the Christmas tree that you mentioned, Alan, this is an interesting story, too, and it comes from Queen Victoria again, who, as I mentioned, she admired the London Illustrated News published an engraving of Queen Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Albert, and several of their children gathering around a Christmas tree and um, in Windsor Castle. A Christmas tree wasn't a big deal in England at that time, but it was in Germany. And uh, Prince Albert had come from Germany and had always celebrated with a Christmas tree. And Queen Victoria's grandmother had been German and she always, uh, Queen Victoria always had a Christmas tree when she was growing up. So the couple really liked the Christmas tree. Um, uh, Hale saw that engraving and decided to publish it in, in Godey's Ladies book. But she wanted to um, kind of um, democratize it. So she took off, she photoshopped it to use a, a modern word she uh, uh, eliminated the tiara on Queen Victoria's head. And because she hated whiskers on men, sorry, Dustin, she uh, had the, um, uh, the, the beard on, um, on uh, uh, Prince Albert removed. And then she published it um, without saying that it was a variation on a Christmas tree at Windsor Castle, just saying that here you know, it looked like it could be any uh, rather well-to-do American family. It was a huge hit, and within a few years, Christmas trees were popping up um, in, you know, um, around the country. I'm just getting started with my uh, young, young Santa Claus. Well, November. It's the Santa Claus is coming to town. It's the Mickey Rooney version. You ever see that? No, but you know, in Sorry. Santa Claus is coming to town, I think, or one of those Santa Claus claymations, he had red hair. I do. Remember yeah, it's that. Mickey Rooney. That's Mickey. It's Rooney? the voice. Oh, the claymation. The is it really? Yeah. I, I mean, it's not that. literally him because it's a claymation. I remember Burl Ives. <laughs> yeah. I got to deal with. <laughs> he was a snowman, not a Santa Claus. Exactly. Yeah, but, but he did. Yeah, one of those Burl Ives. And a communist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was. Out that's right. Day. Oh my God, he was. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, we we just yeah. That's yeah. yeah it's another episode. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, with that being November, you're not supposed to shave your hair, shave your beard, or mustache or something. Yeah, that's I was told because I shaved yeah, this morning. It's no but, shave November. Or yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. But uh, uh, speaking people. of talent or lack of, <laughs> uh, she had a eye for talent, and uh, you mentioned uh, Hawthorne and I believe Poe. So yes. you know who were you know who were some of the writers that she helped create or discover and how was she able to overtake some of the competition that she was facing with some of the other magazines well uh, some of them um who we don't know today but were very popular um were published um by her but the more noteworthy ones were people like hawthorne and poe um and uh, harriet beecher stowe and uh, Longfellow, um, uh, Washington Irving, uh, wrote travel articles for her from London. And um, then the uh, author Francis Hodgson Burnett, who wrote The Secret Garden, a, a favorite of many little girls growing up, 
uh, got her start in Godey's Ladies book. And it, uh, she had a, she was so well educated in um, poetry that it, uh, she had been reading it and criticizing it for so many years that uh, she had a good ear and uh, she knew something was good when she read it. And an example of that is, um, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but one of Hawthorne's, I think it was Hawthorne's first book, which she liked so much that she uh, advised her readers not to wait until they could read it in the library, they should go out and buy it right away. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, how she found him was an interesting story. Um, Poe briefly was a cadet at West Point, as you may remember. And uh, he was there at the same time as Hale's eldest son. And, and <coughs> excuse me. So uh, that's how, her, and her son uh, called Poe to her attention. And she uh, then, she wrote about him and uh, again, praising him as a, a young genius. Poe po in turn praised her as a genius and said she was a fine genius and excuse the um, sexism here, a lady of masculine energy. Oh. That's what I, that's, that's interesting because I define Alan the same exact way. He is a, Oh, you just wait till after this show's over. <laughs> you know, I was gonna say, there's a there's a bit of irony that she wanted to unite the country, you know, with the Thanksgiving and all that. Um, and and th I hope some of our audience don't take this the wrong way. But then she promotes Harriet Beecher Stowe, and I know that that was a big motivation for the abolitionist movement. At least Lincoln said it was. And look where that right. look where that ended up. Yeah. Well. Um this is an interesting aspect of, of Hale's uh, intellect. She was um, deeply against slavery. She thought it was wrong. She thought it was a sin. But at the same time, she uh, did not believe that um, the nation should go to war over this issue. Uh, she, you know, she was a woman, it kind of in her mindset, was a woman of the 18th century and the, um, the founder's bargain in the Constitution uh, on slavery, um, she, you know, she just thought you should stick with it until they found a, a peaceful way to uh, uh, get rid of slavery. Um, and she supported um, what was called the colonization movement in the early 19th century. This was a movement um, that, incurred, that supported uh, sending freed slaves to Africa, specifically to the country of Liberia, which was founded by freed slaves in West Africa. So uh, it was a totally impractical idea, but she uh, wrote a novel about it and she had good intentions, I think. Um, she thought that freed slaves would have a terrible time um, being accepted by whites, that they would face terrible discrimination and um, that they would not be able to earn a living or be happy. So, uh, and she thought in Africa, they could make a fresh start. Um, from the point of view of the 21st century, this is kind of hard to understand. Um, I think it came from her heart, but um, it also you, you, it makes you want to sit down and talk to her and say, well, what about the moral argument? Uh, shouldn't we work to change white societies so that they accept their black brothers? Um, so you know, that was a difficult issue for her. I think it, it it's through your book, it you really speak to the complexity of who Sarah Josepha Hell was. Because um, like you said, some of the things that she, the way that she did things, the way that she thought, especially, and, and Alan and I discuss this quite often on the show, is that we should never 
try to put people from the 18th, 19th, or even further back centuries into today's terms um, and try to look at, at them as if they should n- do things as we would do them today. Yeah, because we don't want to yes. be judged two centuries from now for yeah. the things that we're doing that we think are moral or right. Yeah. You know, but... Or the things that we know are immoral, and yet we personally do not have the power to change. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Dustin and, and Alan. I tried very hard in writing Lady Editor to um, present her as a woman of her, t- of her day and not to uh, judge her from um, uh, uh, my standards or the general standards of the 21st century. And uh, um, this, in my view, is a part of the explanation for why she is not well known today and has not received the accolades uh, and respect that I think she deserves because um, she was anti-suffrage for women. Uh, the suffrage movement you know, really took off after, um, it, toward the end, of, in the second half of the 19th century. And uh, she died uh, in 1780, 1879. So who knows what would have happened had she lived longer. But um, she, her argument was that, as I mentioned earlier, pol- politics was a dirty business. Leave it to the men the women uh, should operate on a higher moral sphere, that they should um, uh, advise the men and their family and their friends, um, and they shouldn't be corrupted by politics and by compromise. She said, let the men fight it out, but the women need to um, stand on principle and remind men uh, constantly what what those principles are. Toward the end of her life, uh, you you see a little weakening of that position when she um, supported the election of women to school boards. And uh, I I thought that was um, an interesting uh, aspect. But Hale was was, uh, a complicated woman and uh, you can't, there were contradictions in her life uh, for example, she said she loathed um, ambition in women, and yet um, you know, she worked as editor of Godey's latest book for 50 years, for heaven's sake, and you know, long before, um, uh, even before she was halfway through her term as an editor, her children had been well-educated, so her job was kind of done. And uh, she had enough money at some point. She could have retired, but she didn't want to. She was always, you know, out there um, uh, doing her work. Um, And she saw her main goal as helping to promote the advancement of of women, um, which she achieved. But without ambition, that's a little hard to swallow. Yeah, maybe she just... uh call it by a different name. Uh, who knows? Maybe she just didn't uh, yeah. label it as ambition. So the subhead in your book is the making of the modern American woman. Um, and as you mentioned in the book, she is, she is yet to be inducted into the national women's hall of fame. Um, and she, as you also mentioned, she seems to almost be lost to history. Thank God you've put this book together. Um, so what do you mean when you when you connect her with making the modern American woman? Well, the word that comes to mind is education. Um, all that women have been able to achieve in the past 200 years, uh, can the, the root of it all is education. When Hale uh, began her magazine in 1828, only half of American women could read and there, were, there was no institute of higher education that accepted women. And yet um, um, I think education and the acceptance of women as the intellectual equals of, of men is um, the, the beginning of the modern day um, vision of what a woman should be or could be, you know, is she, uh, 
she helped change the national conversation about women's roles. And that was um, essential for everything that followed, including, of course, the vote. Um, but there was something else, too. Long before uh, uh, any of us were talking about having it all, um, or uh, Hale was writing about uh, women's um, most important role in life. You know, if you asked her, in my view, if you asked her what was the most um, important thing she had done in her 90 years, I think her answer would have been, um, I am a mother. She thought that uh, women's um, natural uh, uh, role as women, as mothers, pardon me, uh, was their most important role, raising the next generation um, and uh, the most important influence on a child uh, was is typically um, his or her mother. So um, with that in mind, she, another aspect of her work, you know, the, the, alongside her work uh, encouraging women to move into jobs was, um, was trying to elevate the dignity of housekeeping or being a, a wife and mother. And she wrote books on this. Um, the chapter of Lady Editor is that I uh, wrote on this subject is called The Dignity of, of Housekeeping. And she created the term home economics, trying to professionalize the job of a housewife and, and mother. And, uh, you know, uh, that job's not finished in my, in my view. I still think we have a, a, a way to go. But uh, her work in that area was um, uh, definitely laid the groundwork. So, Melanie, last question um, about your book. How important do you think this book is for the modern American woman? And if hell could be here today, um, do you think that she would be proud of the modern American woman? Now, uh, to answer your last question first, I don't know. I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think uh, Hale would probably say, would be, would rejoice in seeing um, women um, uh, working in as many fields as we do and being successful um, and uh, making the same salaries as men and stuff like that. And education, oh my goodness, the idea that half of uh, American college students are, are female, more than half, um, uh, would also, and look at all the graduates from colleges and uh, medical schools, et cetera. So all of that would be, she would, she would be happy about. But I think she would look at um, family life and um, see that we have, um, if not lost something, we, we have a way to go to um, improve family life, uh, especially for uh, the poor. She was a very compassionate person and um, wrote a lot about um, women uh, without means, how to help them, and how to help them help themselves. She deplored charity. She wanted women to, uh, learn a trade or you know, somehow learn how to um, support themselves. But uh, I, you know, I think she would be uh, distressed at, at looking at, uh, at the, all the broken families in our society. Hmm. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah. I think that would probably be the way I'd look at that one too. Mm -hmm. Melanie, thank you again uh, for putting these books together. I mean, the Thanksgiving book was, I, I loved the Thanksgiving book. One, I'm a big holiday guy, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed the Thanksgiving book, thoroughly enjoyed uh, the Lady Editor book. And I think they're, they're both very important books. I think the Lady Editor book is, I'm not going to say it's, you know, it, this is for women to read, uh, because I think men and women 
should both read it and get a sense of the impact that she had on, on American history and American culture, not just then, but moving forward. And especially with this book on, on Thanksgiving, because you mentioned hell in this book a number of times. And that's how I learned about her, you know, uh, uh, and, um, lady editor, editor grew out of my Thanksgiving history. Uh, I became fascinated with her and wanted to learn more. So, um, yeah, well, um, and uh, there, the two books are also unified um, uh, artistically. Uh, the same designer uh, did the covers of and the, uh, the layout inside and the artwork inside the Thanksgiving book. So uh, they're, a, they're a unit. Right. Yeah. I, um, I noticed that because I love the artwork. Um, I actually reached out to her. I can't remember her name, but I reached out to her on Instagram. She didn't respond, but I was like, Hey, you did great. You, you really brought, you know, just a sense of, um, I don't know, just colorfulness and in ease. And so almost like a, like a piece to it. Catherine messenger is her name, Catherine messenger. And she's a delightful person. Well, it was good stuff. And speaking of good stuff, Melanie, thank you again for being on the show. It was a delight to have you. Thank you both. And let me be the first to wish you happy Thanksgiving. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you, thank too. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving <laughs> to you. We'll talk to you later. Well, I got to say, that was a pretty interesting conversation because I'd never heard of this lady. You know, Me neither. So, it, you know, it, this is what I like about our show mm -hmm. in that, you know, we can introduce not only... Um, you know, stories, people, places, events uh, to our audience, but we ourselves uh, yeah. are going to even learn in the process. I mean, remember what Michael Walsh said was, don't write about something you know. Uh, you you know, if you want to know something, yeah, start you write about it or you start teaching it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is definitely one of those... Uh, one of those cases. I mean, what do you think? How do you, uh, how do you like the conversation? I thoroughly, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, Melanie was just very enjoyable to talk to. Um, and just a, a ton of information. And it's, I think it's an, an important topic and an important person to, to remember when I was reading this book, I just like, I kept thinking like, why have I, never heard of her. Why do I not know her? And, and at the same time, I was thinking, I know a ton of people who do not know who she is and the contributions that she made to this country and the influence, like the massive influence that she had moving forward. One of the things that she, you know, she didn't mention was like recipes. Like we now take it sort of for granted. You know, people will like when they go, you know, pick up a magazine or, or whatever it is, especially like, like a good housekeeping or something like that. I know that there's always you know, recipes in there. Um, like that's sort of taken for granted. Like, oh yeah, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. There's going to be some recipes. That was one of the first things she was, that's what she did. Like she started mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. right? But uh, I mean, that's like on the, the, the base level of the things that we talked about, but the influence that she had, um, it's, I hope that her book sort of resurrects Sarah Josepha Hell to where people, it almost becomes like a common name. Like, okay, of, of the women that you learn about in history, she's going to be in there in there now. And I think it is shameful that she's not been put into the National Women's Hall of Fame. You, you know, know, well, when I think of uh, an editor, I don't know if uh, uh, Catherine Graham would the Washington Post, I don't know, was she an owner? Was she like the lead editor or something? I mean, or was that that other dude, the... Don't get me yeah. lying. Well, I don't know. But Catherine Graham, was she the one during the Watergate scandal? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Uh, but, the, I but that other guy, the one that Jason I think Robards she was, played. I think she that... was owner, and her husband died, uh -huh. and so she became like sole owner okay. of it. But, yeah. I mean, I, I really think that this, yeah, I hope this book resurrects her name and gets her name out because yeah. the things that she did... You know, the, the, the people that she discovered, Yeah. you know, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe had a huge influence on Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know I read somewhere, and I don't remember where it was, but uh, Lincoln looked at her and was like, 
you know, you're the reason, this book is the reason why, you know, or what this is all about. Mm -hmm. A huge impact on yeah. our nation. The Opened civil, up a lot of know. people's eyes. Yeah. The, really the whole did. the whole slavery thing, mm -hmm. and you know, and I and I read that it was that that book had a huge influence in Europe also. Yeah, and it just made people realize how evil slavery was. It put a put a face. You know, right. we talked about um, uh, Frederick Douglass, how it, how it put a face on a slave or on the on the uh, the black American. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, hey guys, you know these these are human beings. Yeah. Why are we? looking at them as subhumans. Yeah. So and like speaking of Frederick Douglass and Hale, like pioneers, mm -hmm. right? And obviously Frederick Douglass pioneer for the black American, um, Hell pioneer for women. And it's like the the things that she did, like she opened up the doors for so many women moving forward because like Frederick Douglass proved that all of your um, discriminations or your thoughts that you had about women or black people were mm -hmm. wrong, yeah. you know, were false. And it's like a woman can can do this um, and and do it well and dominate in the in in the in the area of like the magazine, like she was saying, like yeah. the average subscriptions was seven thousand uh -huh. subscriptions, and there's one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. That's that's free. You know, um, I don't know if you're familiar or, or heard of Phyllis Wheatley, but mm -hmm. um, she had uh, she had a big influence, and a lot of people didn't believe that she was the actual writer. Yeah. Um, I know that she wrote something in regards to the Boston Massacre. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's how far back she goes. So yeah. uh, black woman, and yeah, I mean, they're like, nah, we don't think this is you. And yeah. She proved them wrong. So. Yeah. You know, people like that. That needs and and that she needs written, she had written something about uh, George Washington. Uh, George Washington so. was very thankful, mm -hmm. wrote her back. So it's just like the influence, you know, that that people that some people have that are not discussed. And that we actually talked to um, Don Don Frazier about that last week. Like, why is it that a lot of times we hear about the same? you know, groupings, you know, the Ben Franklins, the Napoleons, the Washingtons, you know, yeah. it's just like, we, yeah, we get it. We get it. But we need to, you know, pluck out some of these other people that are just covered up by, by history, by time. Well, you know, I mean, when you talk about, let's say World War II, World War II, there are a hundred million stories that need to be told. And a lot of them, I mean, a lot of the people are dead now. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for people like Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. um, and that, that Rashi, Risha, there's a, there's a, yeah, Indian, the kid. Yeah. 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 Uh, he's going around and he's interviewing every vet from mm -hmm. World War II who's still alive. So, and our friend Tracy Hunter over at World War II, Beyond that's the right. Call, correct. Done correct. a fantastic work. And, and we did a couple ourselves. We, yes. We've we done some. To, uh, yeah. yeah. So we've done some interviews. Um, so yeah, there are, there's millions of stories out there. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, the contributions of of uh, women to making um, our society better, yeah. they, it, they need to be told. They really do. And speaking of women, you're looking a little glass-eyed. <laughs> yeah, I had a... I have, an, I have a hunch. You know, I, I went to uh, go see my mom yesterday, and I didn't leave until... I wanted to watch Hogan's Heroes. I really liked that show um, on MeTV. Mm -hmm. And I left around 10 o'clock, and, and uh, uh, my friend, uh, I'm not going to mention her name, but uh, the one who threw that party a few weeks ago where none of her friends liked me. Yeah. She threw the party, and the party threw you <laughs> out. <laughs> well, no, I left voluntarily, but apparently, you know, people talked about me after I left. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, she's like, hey, come on over. Um, she, she had a guy there. Um, nice guy, and turns out the guy... He I didn't know where that was going. No, 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 no. But it turns out the guy he and I had like same political leanings, and yeah. we, we were like fist bumping and high fiving each other. Yeah, you know, right in front of her face. It was pretty funny. So, she was, like, hey, come here, come here. Yeah, but she serves some great bourbon. I mean, great bourbon. Well, so fantastic. I had a uh, little too much. And, yeah, but but you know what? It was worth it. It was worth every well, look, luckily you got sickening home safe. moment this morning. Every body ache. Every you know nauseating moment it was all worth it it's good that you really worked through that it's good bourbon man i'm proud of you yeah and, of, and i'm here kind of, i'm here today what kind of bourbon was it what was the brand um okay it's got a horse it's um something it's got a horse on top i want to say vernon i don't know why that okay. name is, is I don't uh, 
and she's gonna kick my ass if she watches this video but uh yeah but it's got a horse on it of some sort no yeah. all right i don't know but it's a Really good bourbon. Sea biscuit or something. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and move on to our book and movie recommendations. Okay. Um, I guess I should uh, go first. Thanksgiving. Is that the whole title? I know there's more to oh, it. Oh, there's a subhead, it. yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's written by Melanie Kirkpatrick, so... Right. Um, but but this uh, you know you know that it's this Thanksgiving will be the 400th anniversary yep. of the first Thanksgiving, which so you got to celebrate like super crazy. You know, I'll do it in half a more seconds. Historic, yeah, half seconds. There we go. Um, I, you know, I would love to go back to Plymouth because that's a big deal. The 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving, although you know it wasn't really in November; it was much earlier in mm-hmm. the year. But I mean, we will be celebrating. We will be celebrating. But this this book, it's called The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience. And uh, yeah, so if you want to read up about all that, about Thanksgiving and yeah. the, you know, the way, you know, because Thanksgiving, that the way we celebrate today, I, I know this will come as hard to believe, but all the football, the Cowboys mm-hmm. and the Lions, they didn't do it back then. No. No. But what's what's cool is that in the book, she she sort of goes through all that. Yeah. yeah. There was no, foot, so. no TV in you know. there. You don't know that they could have. They, they could have created like a ball out of uh, deer skin. In well, fact, they, I you think know, they, they did. They uh, funny. They you know, yeah, pig skin. I don't know how they did that, but, but you know, the Indians used to play um, lacrosse. Although I don't think they called it lacrosse because that sounds too Christian. Probably called La Pagan or something. I don't know. <laughs> you really want to go there? No, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was funny when I was thinking it, yeah. but, but when it came out, it kind of... That was, but anyways, that was so yeah. wonderful. All right. So, but, uh, you know, that's how the uh, the, the, the Pontiac's uh, war... Rebellion. Rebellion got started was lacrosse. A game of lacrosse. True story. Up in Mackinac or Fort mm-hmm. Mackinac or something like that. Anyway, all right. So, Thanksgiving by Melanie Kirkpatrick. Okay. Sore losers? Huh? I, no, it was a trick. It was a trick to get them to come out... Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pontiac's. Was it Pontiac's? Pontiac's Rebellion. Was it Pontiac's Rebellion? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was Pontiac's. And it was, wasn't Pontiac's War, but it was at the end of the uh, French-Indian War. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty pretty brutal. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, um, in terms of movies, now, I may have mentioned this recently, but I finally finished No Country for Old Men. Finally? What finally. does that mean? Well, I mean, you know, I had my mom over. I couldn't w- let her watch it because she can't. Tell the difference between reality and, uh, you know, fake movie yeah. type of thing. So she would think, oh, my God, this guy, Anton Chigurh, that guy's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's got Woody Harrelson, Tommy Lee Jones. Um, is, is it Josh Brolin? Is that his name? Yeah. What's his father's name? The one who's married to uh, Barbara. Barbara Streisand. It's something I Brolin. Know. I don't know. Um, but now the, the guy, Javier Bardem, he's a sp- Spaniard. Bardem. Bardem? Is that his name? I don't know what his name is. Uh-huh. But he played Anton Chigurh. Holy cow. That guy, I would hope yeah. to never run into anyone like him. I watched that uh, shortly after it came out, and I was like, I can only watch this movie once. Because he literally, I had, I was anxious and nervous the entire time. I like that, that, that uh, gas. He was, that gas he's probably him. the most intimidating um, villain I've seen on a movie. I mean, I'm just like, uh, I I enjoyed the movie so much, uh-huh. a lot. I was like, man, this is a great movie, but I'm like, I can't put myself through that again. So it was it was rough. It, it was, was very rough. rough. <clears throat> All right, so my book recommendation is obviously Lady Editor Sarah Josepha Hill and the Making of the Modern American Woman. Uh, highly encourage this book. It is very good, um, and it's just somebody that you should know about and. I think it it will help you give credit to whom credit is due. Um, So my book or my movie recommendation is one that came out, also has uh, Josh Brolin and Javier Bardem or Bardem. Uh, Dune just came out. I went and saw it the other night. It is actually really good. Um, It is long, but not drawn out. Um, So if you've ever read the books, which I have not, if you ever watched the original movie, which I also have not, um, 
I saw I'm sure p- that you'll enjoy this. I saw and part if you're of like me and haven't done either, you'll still enjoy it. I saw part of the uh, the original one. Uh, mm-hmm. It had Sting, and then it had that guy that he was. Uh, oh God, Twin Peaks or something like that. I think it was Twin Peaks. Sex. He was Sex in the City. He married uh, one of the girls. Okay. Yeah. He wore a thanks kilt. All right. He wore so, a kilt. He wore a kilt in that. Moving one. on. Yeah. All right. I think he was Scottish. At least he played a Scot. He played a Scot. When did y'all start wearing those kilts? Because they they did not wear kilts. Well, no, but you got to read it in that. They in did that, not in, in that it, book. William Wallace did not wear a kilt. No. So. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I was so disappointed I don't know because when I thought, I thought that movie was so historically accurate. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. I bet. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that brings our show to an end. Next week, we're going to have. Wilfred McClay, the Wilfred McClay. That's going to be a lot of fun uh, having him on the show. Yep. We're looking forward to that. And I mentioned it earlier, we're also going to have Arthur Herman the following week. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be um, great to have him on as well. Um, where can people find us, man? Because we're out of here. All right. Well, they can find us on Facebook. Be sure to like us. Instagram, be sure to follow us. And YouTube, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Tell your friends to subscribe. You know, I don't understand why some of these hot women have like millions of followers, you know, and, and yeah, you know, we should have. Sense. Doesn't make sense. I mean, look at you. You're a m- model and actor, you know. And look at you. You're built like a, a Greek goddess. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that no, is it no, for the show. No, 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 we're, no, we're not done. Oh, yeah. We still have our own website. So in case we ever get shadow banned or whatever, you know, Which or I think they cut happened. us off, yeah, uh, yeah uh, we have our own website, www.thesonsofhistory.com. Mm-hmm. which also has some of our merchandise. There you go. And also, if you haven't yet, uh, wherever you're listening to the podcast, please leave us a rating and review. It definitely helps us out. All right, that is it. And I feel like I wanted to say something else, but I think we've drawn on long enough. All right, we'll see you next week.